Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Ignite News Magazine from the journalism students at Mohawk College. I'm Nick Heinnap. And I'm Kareem Mosna. Can you smell it? It's November. It's a month-long celebration of everything burgers. But as Stephen Sobot tells us, it's more than just stuffing your face. Move aside, Oktoberfest. Hello, Novemberger. Novemberger is a month-long burger festival hosted by Urbanicity. 29 pubs, bars, and diners each created their own unique burger, each with their own flavors and ingredients. Each restaurant donates $1 to the United Way for each burger bought. The Thirsty Cactus on King Street in Dundas is one such restaurant that's participating. They featured the Cactus del Fuego, a savory meld of southwestern flavors and condiments. Chef and burger savant Peter Metropolis describes his vision. I have a burger inspired by the restaurant itself, the Cactus. Um, a lot of southwest flavors, so tequila battered jalapenos, chipotle ketchup, uh, roasted poblano and corn relish, then straws of uh, tortillas, and uh, it's pretty typical of something we'd run like on the weekend or something as a special. During November, you can go to any of the restaurants and order their burger. Once you've tried it, you can go to the November Burger website and rate it based on its taste, presentation, and creativity. Every vote enters you into a raffle for $250 at any one of the featured eateries. Urbanicity editor and publisher Martinez Gilensi says Hamilton's exactly the kind of city for a festival like this to thrive in. There seems to be a real food culture here. People are, new restaurants are popping up everywhere. People are blogging about food a lot. Uh, I'm not a foodie myself, but I can appreciate that others are. And so we wanted to take our media channels and kind of put that behind a festival that might bring together the food community and also kind of cross the borders of the different regions of Hamilton. If you're looking to try something new around Hamilton, November Burger is the perfect event for you. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Stephen Sobot. Hamilton has always been known as a steel city, but lately there hasn't been much steel production going on here. But Nick, there's still one company that's focused on steel, but not in a way that you've seen. It's out in Halton Hills. We went to check it out. Steelform is an emerging company competing with top luxury brands like Alessi from Italy and Stelton from Denmark. Founder Craig Ball says the company's origins run through his family history. My grandfather in India is a manufacturer of stainless steel tableware. He's been in the industry since 1963 and I started importing his products from uh, 2001 into Canada for the North American market trying to focus on food service, so retail, uh, food service, hotels, restaurants, uh, gift shops and, uh, and also promotional products. Um, the company kind of evolved over time and I started to take more of an interest in creative design and I think that's kind of where my, I learned that my passion was truly actually design versus importing uh, developed products from overseas. Ball explains that Steelform has many advantages as an up-and-coming Canadian manufacturing company. I think that Canadians appreciate something made in Canada. Not a lot is made in Canada today. Um, it is very true that European brands have a, a, a lengthy head start over a company like Steelform. For example, companies in Italy have been in this industry for 100 plus years. Um, but also, once you're large, it's also you, you move slower and you react slower to market demand. Steelform's manufacturing process starts with plain stainless steel bowls, which he calls blanks, a concept inspired by his spouse's business. My wife's an optometrist, and what they do in the optical industry is they take what's called a blank. A blank is basically a lens that already has a prescription in, in the lens, but it needs to be grinded down into fitting into a, to fit into a frame. So basically the blank concept, which we use here, came from that kind of idea of taking an inexpensive raw material and uh, adding value to it using modern technology. Industrial designers create the design of the patterns using 3D CAD, or computer animated design software. The designs are then converted into a CAM file, or computer aided manufacturing, which allows the laser cutting machine to precisely cut the patterns into the blanks. So we work with uh, independent designers, um, uh, industrial designers basically based out of Hamilton. We also work with uh, two designers out of New York, a designer named Kareem Rashid and another designer named Lisa Smith out of New York. And we basically load them on a 3D laser cutting machine which allows us to cut just about any pattern into the 23 blanks using CAD software. So basically we work with an industrial designer that helps us develop themes or lines based on what we're looking to add to our collection. 
and then we use our in-house engineer to do all the CAD drawings and convert them to CAM files in order to be cut. Steel form has the unique ability to produce colored, scratch-resistant stainless steel. So basically we use a, a process called PVD, physical vapor deposition, and um, it's a titanium-based formula which actually enhances scratch resistance, enhances corrosion resistance, and it allows you to color steel in various colors. So the standard colors that we have recently launched are a black titanium, a gold, a rose gold, and we're working on a copper finish as well, which we should be launching in January. According to Ball, the colored, scratch-resistant stainless steel bowls are not only more practical, but also very fashionable. And what this does is it um, reduces the coldness of stainless steel, that surgical look of stainless steel, and it appeals to a broader market. Visually appealing as well as more functional because you've enhanced the scratch resistance, which um, everyone knows that stainless steel does scratch over time. Um, it is a, a hard material, but scratches do appear fairly easily. Currently, you can find Steelform's products at select luxury stores throughout North America and Australia. Uh, we're currently sold in about 100 stores in North America. We launched about 14 months ago. Um, in the GTA, we're in um, about a dozen stores, including William Ashley's um, in Yorkville. We're in a, a store called Dana Jordan. We are in uh, Burgo Designs. You can see his entire collection and find where his products are sold on his website, steelform.com. For tonight News, I'm Kareem Mosna. This past Saturday, Hamilton hosted its first ever Hammer Blues Fest. The event showcased some of Canada's top blues acts. There was the tuning of instruments, the tapping of feet, and the shaking of hips. The first ever Hammer Blues Fest went off without a hitch this past Saturday at the Knights of Columbus Hall. An impressive lineup of blues artists plucked from as far as the coast to the city that provided host. The unexpected success of the festival had artists and organizers alike inspired and excited from the minute that the doors opened. Local blues stalwart Jack DeKaiser felt that this is the kind of blues festival that Hamilton has needed. I met uh, John, Big John, uh, and uh, also Ken Wallace from uh, Mohawk College. They invited me to come and play the show and told me it was going to be their first annual one. And it's awesome to see that it's sold out. Though it's the first annual Hammer Blues Fest, Big Johnny Blue, another organizer, explains that it's actually part of the bigger picture with the Hamilton Blues Society. Well, what we did is, is uh, back in 2010, we started the, uh, the Blues uh, Society, like I told you before, and we had decided that Hamilton doesn't have a dedicated blues festival. So we decided to take a chance on it and do it this year. Well, taking a chance next year won't be necessary as we're all looking forward to what's in store. For Ignite News, I'm Nick Heimnapp. In the last six years, what are known as Victory Gardens have been popping up around Hamilton. The gardens present a unique opportunity for Hamiltonians to come out and give back, as the produce harvested will be donated to food banks around the city. At the Philpott Memorial Church Garden, Urban Ministry Director Jeff Beatty said that the majority of his volunteers are international students from around the world. Whether you come out for the gardening or the company, Hamilton Victory Gardens would be happy to have you. Well, about 2008, um, Bill and Judy uh, Wilcox were up on the mountain and um, they thought a community garden would be really fun. And I thought it was, I think it was at that time just for the people, it was at a church actually. And they thought, well, you know, maybe we have so much extra food, why don't we take it to a food bank? And then they saw that the, the um, fresh vegetables and stuff were lacking in the food banks, mostly tinned food. So uh, someone said, hey, well, why don't you just expand the garden? They did. And then other people said, well, we've got um, basically unused uh, lots of land. Uh, why don't we repurpose it? And so actually the Cancord lot is famous because it used to be a hangout for prostitutes and drug dealers. So it's been um, revitalized. It's a huge garden, the biggest one of all 12 sites. And uh, so what's this uh, six years later? Um, this year, I think uh, 41 thousand pounds of produce was delivered fresh produce we don't use any um, any uh, sprays or um, what do you call those things again pesticides. pesticides yes it's pesticide free I mean you can even eat those leaves I think I think I can uh, if I work here I can uh, meet a lot of guys from other countries and uh, I, th I can I think I can make uh, some new friends and I I want to learn more about Canada 
because I, I I've been here for one year. I wanna I don't wanna just stay in the apartment to the to my assignment or the, to to my project in the in the lab. I just wanna uh, get off my apartment. Although the gardening season is done growing here at Philpott Memorial Church, it'll be sprouting up again next season so that the volunteers can continue producing produce. For Ignite News, I'm Elaine Morris. The days are getting shorter and here at Mohawk, classes are going longer. So if you're a student who's afraid to walk home or to your car at night, Mohawk's Walk Smart program is there to help. WalkSmart program is a, a volunteer-based program that runs Mondays to Thursdays from 6.30 to 10.30. And we have teams of volunteers that will come around and uh, walk you to your car, uh, the bus stop, or your local home if you need help with your bags or if you just want someone to walk with you. So luckily at Mohawk, we've never had any issues of harassment or sexual assault on campus. We've been lucky like that. But other campuses in Ontario have had um, problems. So this is more of a preemptive thing for us. And we, we act as an extra set of eyes and ears for security. We have walkie-talkies that we keep in contact with security with. So we can walk around and act as an, like, an extra set of eyes and ears for the, for the security program and help out just keeping this campus safe. We're really focused on providing a friendly and promoting a friendly and safe environment and a positive learning environment for our night school students. Make them feel comfortable and safe when they're coming here. If you want to get a walk, um, feel free to come by our office and uh, we're located in McCasey's across from the Mini Tim Hortons. Um, or you can give us a call or shoot us an email at uh, walksmart, all one word, at mohawkcollege.ca and we can schedule a walk for you. Or just flag down a group of volunteers whenever you see them on campus. We're wearing the big yellow sweater, the hoodies with WalkSmart across them. Or we have white t-shirts with a logo on the back. Or we also have big yellow jackets with WalkSmart on them. So we're very easy to find. And if you see us, we will be more than happy to give you a walk wherever you want in the area. We'll be walking around anywhere around campus. We'll be outside, we'll be indoors. and. All you have to do is find us in NAS and we'll be very happy to help you. Uh, the reason for having a program like this is just to ensure the safety of all the students. We want to make sure they're having a fun, safe and healthy school environment for everybody. Over the course of the three years that I've been with the program, we've grown exponentially. We have a lot more volunteers that are out helping out every night walking around campus. Um, and also we've had a lot more walks and people using the program, people who are aware of the program. We've really been pushing to promote the program on campus with welcome nights and serving up free popcorn and stuff like that to let people know what we are and why we're here. Um, we've been going over to Res a lot and talking to them, letting them know that we're here, that we can walk you to, even if it's just a, a simple walk from campus to residence. As long as if you don't feel safe, by all means, come on and um, call, call us up and let us know that you need a walk. We'd be more than happy to join you on your way to residence. So we really just try to promote ourselves as much as possible on campus, let everyone know that the service is here for them and we are willing to help and it's a free service. You never need to pay us anything. Um, we're, we work under the McCasey's banner, so the, the Continuing Education uh, Services, and we are looking to just create a friendly and safe, positive learning environment for students to come and learn in. If you want to get involved, you could, uh, uh, you could shoot an email off to the email or you could call us and we'll be happy to answer any questions about it or you could just walk right in to our head office that's in the McCasey's room and we'll be able to help you and sign you up right there. October means Halloween, Halloween means zombies, and these zombies mean business. This October marked the 8th annual Hamilton Zombie Walk, a non-profit event that combines festive scares with a strong community spirit, as well as offering food drive donations. Event organizer Aaron Allen says that turnout rates increase as time goes on. It gets bigger every year. The last two years before this we had bad weather though, so that kind of hampered it. Today was really nice. I'm seeing a lot more younger people, a lot more kids actually. 
The gathering attracted all sorts of undead, from adults... I honestly just dumped blood on my head, and like I put this on like 10 minutes. ...to children. How long did it take to do your makeup? A lot. And even entire families. I thought of it on the spot. I thought, there's five of us, why not do a wedding party? Yeah. And the kids were in for it too. Though the event was a general success, some felt that more publicity was needed. It's actually more than I anticipated. I, because of the notice that I got, I didn't think there would be much people there. My friends didn't even know about it. Like They're like, oh, what's the zombie walk last minute? But I tell everyone and they don't listen. So you need like posters or something, I don't know. I'm actually quite surprised. I didn't think this many people would be here. It's gathering quite nicely, it is gathering actually, quite nicely. We got here half an hour ago and uh, there wasn't half as many people here. It's a great zombie walk, it's a great time for everybody, and it's an excellent cause that they're getting food bank donations for. As for the future, Alan says it's up to the people. We do everything on a volunteer basis, so if people want to get involved and make it bigger, make it badder, make it bloodier, they're more than welcome to join us, and then we would have more of that push. The holiday may be over, but the zombie walk proved once again how a fun idea can grow into something great. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Ben Diamond. Every Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, vendors and customers of all sorts come to the corner of York and James to participate in the Hamilton Farmers Market. Founded in 1837, the market is a place for the community to gather and exchange a wide variety of local produce and culturally diverse products. Some farmers, like Shane Coleman of Dilly's Pharmacy, have been participating for many generations. My family's been on the market since 1835. I'm like the fifth generation. Been farming in Stony Creek. Well, actually, this this is an indoor market it's year round, so actually the winter time is quite busy because all the smaller markets close down. Um, but we also go to outdoor markets in Burlington, and, and the summer is obviously the biggest when the produce is in full season. Some vendors, like Andrea Boyu, have used this market to start a new business. I originally was, when I first started the market, I sold flowers and I sold some of these painted pieces that I did. Um, I went to Sheridan College for graphic design. I've always done them and uh, gave them away as gifts and people really liked them. So I started selling them on the side and it ended up being more popular than the flowers. So that sort of led me into everything else. Established companies like Carlick Pastry use the farmer's market as one of many locations to sell their products. The place where we make is just on Barton Street, but we have also the other stores, which one is ordering from us. It's um, Denninger and uh, uh, Starsky, and uh, the rest of them is in Toronto and Mississauga. And although the majority of customers are regulars and residents of Hamilton, some are visiting from other cities. This is the first time we've been here. We're from Toronto with Time of Your Life tours that work out of... Uh, come out of Toronto and they take a variety of tours. We've done one with them before. The market is open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. four days of the week and is perfect for people that are bored of typical big box grocery stores. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Tanya Guerra. Quails in the Nest is a local band that might be on the verge of something big. Megan Adams sat down with them to see what makes them click. I grew up in Hamilton. Uh, I went to Mac for neuroscience. Uh, met Mikey in high school. And I've been playing drums for about 20 years. Uh, started playing with Mikey about three or four years ago. My dad was a drummer. Um, so I started when I was four. Uh, he listened to a lot of 80s, like Super Tramp, Sticks. Rush and Zeppelin and all that stuff. Born and raised Hamilton. Um, loved music pretty much all my life. High school, I was in a band called The Social Theory, and uh, all the rest was another band, and then Quails in the Nest. Rooted from my dad, pretty much. He, uh, ever since I was a, like a little baby, uh, he would just play record upon record upon record, and I guess I kind of picked up from, uh, from there. And because I played drums, I just always, always played. I mean, I, I grew up knowing a lot of guitar players. I didn't know a lot of drummers. Um, so I played with all these different guitar players that knew I was a drummer. Um, so that benefited me in a, in, a, in a huge way, I think. There's a lot of different types of drummers and different types of styles, and this is just the style that I um, 
admire. There's a meaning to the name. Uh, it's very familial, very um, personal, very a, a, a good sense of the name encompasses um, a lot of history that Mikey and I have as friends and as a family. Like we've played at uh, at certain uh, store openings. Mm -hmm. We played fundraisers and charity events. The first record we did uh, was in two th last year. We found a place in Selkirk, uh, and it was a heritage house. I guess it's kind of a personal record. Um, when it comes down to uh, to a whole writing aspect of it. Um, I take a lot, you know, what's going on in my life, and uh, I try to incorporate that in the record and, you know, in what we write. You know, whatever is happening in my life, um, you know, whether it's, it's something happy in my life or something sad, you know, um, I try to incorporate that, like, within lyrics. If I had to put it in a nutshell of folk rock. Our philosophy is give back, give and take. It's somewhat of a golden age for animation in television and in movies. Animators can do things that would have been impossible just a few years ago, but story is still king. Kyle Williamson has more. What Media has put together a compilation of some of the world's best animated short films. These animated pictures have shown at film festivals across the world and can now be enjoyed by you at home. What has done a good job of creating a wide assortment of work? Some of these pictures are humorous, while others are more serious. At times, the vibe going from one film to another can be jarring. It's emotionally confusing. You go from funny, to serious, to cute, and end up feeling sad. You will also see a difference in artistic style. A la Francaise and Beast are both so rich with graphic detail that you could stop on each frame and stare at the artistry that went into these films. A short film isn't always about the artistic detail, however. Sometimes it is about taking 10 minutes to tell a lasting story. Cargo Cult does this by using very simple animation to convey a story to remember. While children may find a few of these films funny, they really require a more mature appreciation of art. These eight films are works of art and should be appreciated as such. I give these eight an amazing short stories an overall rating of 4 out of 5, and is available for rent or to buy at the iTunes store. For Ignite Entertainment, I'm Kyle Williamson. What? It was a great week for both the men's and women's varsity basketball teams as they defeated St. Clair College here at the D-Bar. Let's take a look at the highlights. The Mohawk Mountaineers opened the floodgates as they poured on the points in a 120-111 victory over the St. Clair Saints. Mountaineers guard Matt Fennell led the team with 45 points and 9 rebounds. Forward Andrew Sicatini scored 22 points and had 10 rebounds, while point guard Matt Savell picked up 23 points and 6 assists. Although it was a win for Mohawk, head coach Brian Yonker says the men have some work to do. We scored a lot of points, but we gave up a lot of points. So defensively, we, uh, we didn't play very well, but um, we hung on and got a win out of it, so we'll take that. The Mountaineers dominated the boards, picking up 50 rebounds, while the Saints only managed 29. What Mohawk lacked in defensive presence, they made up for in spades on the offensive side. They managed to keep a strong lead against St. Clair for the beginning of the game, but the Saints managed to match the Mountaineers point for point during the second half. Uh, we held them by like 20 points the whole game until the last two minutes, and then we collapsed a bit, but we managed to hold them off, and we got the W, and that was the main, that was the main goal. Mohawk will be taking on Redeemer at 8 p.m. on Friday, November 7th at the Debark. In the meantime, the team will be working on their defense, ball movement, and finishing easy baskets. For Ignite Sports, I'm Carlin McGill. The Mohawk women's basketball team clipped the Saints' wings over the weekend, beating St. Clair 81-68.
The game was a perfect example of why head coach Kevin Duffy considers Rachel Abella one of the best players in the league. Abella had 23 points, 10 assists, 8 rebounds, and 5 steals in the victory, dominating in every aspect of the game. She led the team in every one of those categories in her outstanding performance. 23 points, 8 rebounds, 10 assists. So she was uh, two boards away from a triple double. She had an outstanding game. Uh, you know, uh, she's an all Canadian level player, and uh, this is her last year, and I'm going to enjoy coaching her for her last year. After holding on to a two point lead at half, Mohawk surged ahead in the third quarter, leading 57 40 going into the fourth. The team shot just over 40% in the game and almost 60% from the free throw line to tally an impressive 81 points in the win. The ladies improved their record to the 500 mark after an upsetting loss to Humber in their season opener. We probably would have been uh, more successful, but that's the way it's going to be in a competitive league like that. Uh, you know, if you don't bring your A game for all 40 minutes, uh, you're going to find yourself on the losing end, and that's what ended up happening to us uh, out there. The Mountaineers look to improve to a winning record when they host Redeemer on Friday, November 7th. Tip-off is 6 p.m. at the Debark. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Sean Maranka. It's only three games into the season, and the stakes are already as high as they could possibly be for the Mountaineer men. Fresh off an OCAA gold medal to end last year, and three straight victories to open up the season, the Mohawk Mountaineers have been named the top-ranked team in the province by the OCAA. Uh, we're very honoured uh, as a team to be ranked number one coming out in, in the first rankings. Uh, you know, we had some preseason losses that I still think, uh, I don't know if they garnered that uh, ranking, but uh, we're very honoured and uh, we understand that we still have a lot of work to do and uh, we're really focused on making sure that uh, that ranking doesn't sneak into our practices and we're training still to be the best every night we can be and still moving forward because now that we're at the top, the only place we have to go is down, so we've got to work even harder to stay there as now we're the target for every team in Ontario. Schnarr says he thinks the ranking is a result of both the team's strong finish last year as well as the minimal turnover his roster experienced. We have about uh, 11 to 12 returning guys with uh, when we brought in four or five uh, great recruits that are, have allowed us to continue to, to excel. Third-year player Trevor McLaughlin says that while the ranking does serve as a boost of confidence, it doesn't mean much in the big picture. You really have to live up to it. It really it means nothing until you can go out there and prove it. It means everybody else is kind of gunning for you. You have to can't take a night off or else someone will overtake you. That no-quit attitude is something McLaughlin says Coach Schnarr has instilled on the team. You know, this is Mohawk volleyball. We have a long tradition of being successful, and it just, it just gets the guys really pumped to want to live up to the expectations of Mohawk volleyball. Schnarr says he maintains high expectations as a means of motivation for his players. Uh, I really believe in, in battling every night. I believe that you can't ever take an opportunity like this for granted. We have a very special team and as long as we come in every night to work hard um, from the coaching staff down, I don't think there can ever be an issue about our performances. The team was also ranked third in Canada behind only Red Deer and Medicine Hat. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Joshua Cooper. That's all we have for this week's edition of Ignite News. For more info, you can go to ignitenews.ca. I'm Nick Heinap. And I'm Kareem Mosner. Thanks for watching.